In the famous painting of the School of Athens, the two leading lights of Greek philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, are shown disputing over whether philosophy should search for the source of all good things in heaven or on earth, and their successors have been arguing the same question for 23 centuries without figuring it out. But for two guys living in Athens at that time, the correct answer should have been obvious in about 10 seconds. All of Athens' philosophy, geometry, science, and art, not to mention its army and navy, were based on things of the earth, specifically silver. Throughout Greece's classical period, when Athenian power and culture flourished, it was a steady flow of silver that supported everything. Silver and what it could buy built the Parthenon, armed the hoplites, rode the triremes, and brought in enough wealth for citizens to sit on their rear ends building the foundations of modern philosophy instead of doing some actual work. The result? The most powerful military, the most advanced science, and the greatest art and architecture of its time. And all thanks to silver. The silver flowed into Athens from a giant complex of mines called Lavrion, also known by its Romanized name of Laurium. By the Classical period, it had already been mined for nearly 3,000 years. Right around 3200 BC, about when the Bronze Age began in Greece, miners started pecking at the stony hills around Lavrion, laboriously fire-setting or hammering stones apart and winnowing a little bit of silver and a little bit of copper out of them. They didn't get much at first, just enough for a few drachmas and some bronze. During the Bronze Age, Athens still imported most of its metals from overseas. But in 483 BC, miners working the lean ores unexpectedly struck a thick vein of high-grade silver minerals. There ensued the 5th century BC version of the California Gold Rush, only for silver. Athenian entrepreneurs competed to rent the rights to mine a particular area of Lavrion from the Athenian government. Then they rushed out and started working, or rather, they rushed out and their slaves started working. Thousands of miners chipped out the rock and carried it to the surface, where it was crushed down to a fine size. The ore minerals were dense because they contained both lead and silver, so the next step was to concentrate them by sluicing or panning. Then they separated the silver from the lead with a particular type of smelting process called cupellation. This involved placing the minerals in a crucible made from bone ash and heating them up in a furnace, thereby exploiting a chemical difference between silver and lead. Lead, when heated, would bond with oxygen and form a lead oxide that soaked into the bone ash, leaving a button of pure silver metal sitting on top of the crucible, since silver is incapable of bonding with oxygen and thus can't soak into the crucible. The mine owner got a fat percentage of the silver, but most of it was carried to Athens. The trickle of silver turned into a flood. The tetradrachmon, a silver coin worth not one but four drachmas, went from rare to ubiquitous. Now, what to do with all that money? In most parts of the world in the early 5th century BC, that would have been a silly question. It all belonged to the king, of course. But not in Athens, which had recently ditched a dictatorship and, after years of convulsion, was trying democracy on for size. Every freeborn man was a citizen, and every citizen had a say in where the money went. So in 482 BC in Athens, the money from that silver would go wherever the majority voted to send it. Democracy being roughly then what it is now, attempts to influence the vote started before the first tetradrachmon was minted. At the center of the struggle were two prominent Athenians named Aristides and Themistocles, longtime rivals in society, politics, and allegedly romance. The two represented opposite ends of the economic, social, political, and personal spectrum. Aristides was a nobleman, so famous for probity that his contemporaries called him Aristides the Just. In contrast, the origins of Themistocles were obscure and probably best left that way, and his principles were conspicuous for their absence. But he did have a talent for rhetoric. He really hated Aristides, and the torrent of silver now pouring out of Lavrion offered endless opportunities to improve himself, or at least his political position. Aristides had suggested using the silver to pay each citizen a personal dividend, 
a position he calculated should win him the favor of the voting public. Themistocles offered the citizenry of Athens something more precious than money, revenge. He got everyone fired up about the threat of competition from the island city-state of Aegina just to the south. He reminded everyone that Aegina had not only just defeated Athens in a minor war, its people also worshipped the wrong gods and hogged all the richest sea-trading business. Adding to the aggravation, the Aegonetans had been playing footsie with the Persian Empire next door. Its ruler Xerxes styled himself Great King, King of Kings, King of Persia, King of Babylon, King of Egypt, and King of Nations, and was rumored to be about ready to try adding King of Greece to the list. The governing class of Aegina had sympathized with Persia during the abortive invasion attempt by the previous Persian emperor a few years earlier. Conveniently ignoring the fact that so had a lot of Athenians, Themistocles denounced Aegina as a nest of traitors and a commercial and military menace, and suggested that if they spent the silver on 200 triremes, they could really pound their rivals into the dirt. In support, he cited a hot-off-the-presses prophecy from the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, a priestess who spent her days inside a cave perched on a three-legged stool that straddled a crack in the floor of the cave. Inspired either by the spirit of the god or by the hallucinogenic gases coming from the underlying rock, depending on whom you believe, she had informed an Athenian deputation that wooden walls would secure them against another invasion by the Persians. Before the assembled citizenry, Themistocles argued that wooden walls meant ships, and that his plan of using the silver to build a navy to crush Aegina and defend against possible Persian attack was therefore not only the path to power, wealth, and righteousness, it was also God's will. What more was there to say? Themistocles' arguments won. Aristides was banished from Athens via the recently invented practice of ostracism, and construction began on the Athenian trireme fleet. It was not a moment too soon. While the Athenians mined silver and built ships, Xerxes, great king, king of kings, etc., had assembled a gigantic military force and was busy crossing the Hellespont into Greece. By the autumn of 480 BC, the Persians had overcome stiff resistance from a Spartan-led coalition at Thermopylae, overrun most of the Greek city-states, and laid waste to Athens with fire and sword. But the remaining armies of the Spartans, Athenians, and allies, including the forces of Aegina, for once cooperating altogether, had not been defeated and were holed up in the fortified Isthmus of Corinth. Meanwhile, the Persian army was overextended and starting to run out of supplies, making it imperative for them to end the campaign with a quick victory as soon as possible. Rather than attempt a frontal assault against well-fortified positions, the Persian commanders decided to try an end run around the Isthmus. After all, a flanking maneuver had worked at Thermopylae. But given the geography, and the fact that not even the elite Persian immortals could walk on water, a flanking maneuver would require the navy. And the Greek fleet, led by Themistocles and several allied commanders, was waiting there. Initially, Xerxes seems to have been reluctant to send his ships into the narrow straits, where their vast numbers would be a handicap rather than an advantage. Themistocles decided to help him make up his mind, and secretly dispatched a messenger to tell Xerxes that the Greek leaders were busy fighting amongst themselves, the sailors would flee at the first sign of an attack, and that he himself was just dying to come over to the Persian side. Xerxes thought that sounded good. After all, listening to a Greek traitor had worked at Thermopylae. So he sat on a high throne on land and watched his ships crowd into the confined waters of Salamis Bay. Several hours of ramming attacks later, something close to half the Persian fleet had been destroyed, and completing the conquest of Greece that season was out of the question. Most of the invading army retreated back into Anatolia. The remainder stayed behind to try to salvage a victory on land, which more or less worked for about a year, until they ran into a large army of Spartan and allied forces at Plataea. A short while later, the Persian threat to Greece had been decisively ended. 
Hoplites returned home, Athens was rebuilt, and a resumed flow of silver from Lavrion began to fund a cultural and intellectual renaissance and a mighty empire. This empire grew at the expense of many of Athens' recent allies. With the Persian threat gone, the Greeks got back to their time-honored pastime of squabbling amongst themselves. But now the fight was less even than it had been. The war had left Athens in possession of the most effective navy in the region. The trade of its old enemy Aegina had dried up during and after the war, leaving the former maritime power a poorer shadow of its former self. Still remembering their old grudges, the Athenians began throwing their weight around the region. They began demanding large sums in tribute from their one-time allies, using the navy that Lavrion Silver had built to destroy cities that resisted and kill or enslave their inhabitants. Aegina was one of them. The league consisting of Athens and its nominal allies, but actual tributaries, grew larger, grew stronger, and grew more and more dependent on Athens, the center of a de facto empire. The expansion of Athenian power drew worried attention from Sparta, the other Greek city-state that had emerged from the Persian Wars with a dominant position, albeit on land rather than at sea. Like Athens, its influence, power, and ambitions grew through the middle of the 5th century BC. War might not have been inevitable, but with each side mistrusting the other and little motivation to cooperate, it became increasingly likely. In the 430s BC, a series of arguments over colonies, minor conflicts, and economic sanctions tumbled into open warfare between the Athenian and Spartan spheres of influence. The Peloponnesian War had started. At first, neither side could gain conclusive victory. Both sides raided and marauded, but the Spartans were as careful to avoid sea battles as the Athenians were to avoid land battles, and no decisive engagements could be fought. As the war progressed, the Spartans decided to break the deadlock by changing strategies. In 413 BC, they occupied the fort of Decalea, just outside of the Lavrion mining complex. From there, they blocked the transport of silver to Athens and raided the mines, freeing the 20,000 slaves who worked them and destroying the above-ground infrastructure. The foundations of the Athenian economy collapsed. Scrambling for cash, the Athenians squeezed their allies even harder for tribute, but this proved insufficient to supply their war effort. In desperation, they even resorted to melting down golden statues of Athena Nike, the goddess of victory, and minting them into coinage. But those supplies could provide only temporary relief, and over the next ten years, economic strangulation slowly brought Athens down to defeat. More than 22 centuries would pass before the mines of Lavrion again began to produce large amounts of silver, this time for the newly independent and united Greece. The mines were exhausted finally in the late 20th century, and mining shut down again. But even today, the art, architecture, science, and philosophy of ancient Athens remain as a testimony to what the silver mines provided.